Hello, everyone. Welcome to Module 3, Session 4 of ML Foundations. Our speaker today is Farul. So if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to use the chat or the Q&A box. With that said, I will hand it over to our speaker. Thanks, Franklin. Just a quick uh, check. Uh, I hope my slides are clear and uh, visible, and so is my microphone. Yes. OK, thank you. So hello, everybody, and welcome to yet another session of the Machine Learning Foundations, Module 3. So today, we have come to the fourth and the final session of the ML Foundations. And next week, we would be starting with the hands-on deep learning module. And today, we are going to touch upon a very interesting aspect of machine learning, which most of the times, though we know it exists, but most of the times, uh, machine learning is thought to be only supervised. So we're going to today look at some of the interesting use cases of unsupervised machine learning with the help of H2O open source library. So let's get started. So a quick uh, review of what we've done in the past. So we are currently in the third module and we started with uh, supervised learning. We looked at few of the classification and regression used cases. Then from there, we moved on to the automated machine learning concept and we studied how to perform automated machine learning, both in open source as well as H2 driverless AI. Now, having sufficient knowledge of what machine learning is and how we are using it in real life, today we are going to jump into another aspect of machine learning known as unsupervised machine learning. So what you can expect in the session, we'll quickly go over uh, what is unsupervised learning and then we'll see what are the algorithms which are available in H2O's open source library which support unsupervised learning. Then we are going to look at uh, three very interesting use cases pertaining to unsupervised machine learning uh, via three algorithms, clustering, isolation forest, and PCA. And then we'll wrap up with a, a quick uh, info about what we're going to see next in this machine learning module. Again, uh, as we always say, the quizzes and hands-on exercises will be available on the portal. Uh, you can go and try out. And particularly for this module, the case study is going to be very interesting. So I highly encourage you to go through it and try to do it uh, on your own. Uh, because uh, having, um, uh, if you'll go through the case study, uh, this is pertaining to a real life example of anomaly detection. And with that, you'll be able to solve any other problem which pertains to anomaly detection. So it could be a good uh, project for you if you would want to try that. So now let's uh, quickly see as to what unsupervised learning is. So as the name suggests, unsupervised means without supervision. So in this case, the model is provided with a data set like in all machine learning problems but it isn't labeled. So we essentially do not know what is the target. We do not know whether we need to predict a category or we need to predict some continuous number like sales or interest rate. We just have data. And then the algorithm, the unsupervised algorithm, they attempt to find patterns and structure in that data by extracting useful features. So the model organizes data in different ways, depending upon the algorithm at hand. Some of the common use cases of unsupervised learning are clustering, for instance, customer segmentation, uh, anomaly detection, which is used in fraud detection. One of the ways in which anomaly detection can be used is in fraud detection. And then in dimensionality reduction, where we need to reduce the number of features in a data set without losing much of the information. So let's see how a typical unsupervised machine learning algorithm works. So this sort of is the, you could say, uh, an overview of the clustering algorithm. So say you have customer purchase data and you have the data, but you, you don't want to predict anything out of it. You just want to analyze it for any patterns that you may find. So you train an unsupervised algorithm and it finds patterns and it recognizing three specific patterns in the data set. 
and it groups those customers. So you could see three distinct groups, yellow, green, and red. Now these groups could be uh, age-wise. Maybe there are children, maybe adults, maybe teenagers. It could be gender-wise or the clustering could also be uh, income-wise. So maybe the yellow ones are the high-income people, whereas the red ones are the low-income people and green ones are the medium-income people. So it's absolutely uh, on the algorithm. It tries to find out patterns. And every point in a cluster uh, shares properties which are more closer to the other uh, points in the same cluster. So all the yellows, they'll share a common property and so with the green and so with red. So when next time you get new customer purchase data, say for the next month, you can again use the same model that you used before, and it will again find similar patterns, but on the different data set. So here's how a typical unsupervised machine learning algorithm works. And probably not all, but this uh, sort of works in case of clustering, which we will also show as an example. So now let's quickly jump over to H203 uh, capabilities and what are the available algorithms that we have in H203. So currently H2 supports uh, the following unsupervised algorithms. What I'm going to do is I'll quickly go over all of them, but uh, for the demonstration purpose, I'll be only touching upon uh, the last three. So the first is aggregator. So as the name suggests, the aggregator means to aggregate or combine something. So it's a clustering based method for reducing a numerical or a categorical data set into another data set which has fewer rows. So it sort of reduces your data sets by aggregating certain columns together. And the output of the aggregation will be a new aggregated frame. So it gives you altogether a different data frame which you can then access with Python or R. The next one is generalized low rank models, also abbreviated as GLRM. So GLRMs are pretty interesting algorithms. And why they are used? Uh, they are used to reduce the dimension of a data set. So if you are aware of PCA, uh, which we will cover later, that is also a dimensionality reduction algorithm. So it is similar to PCA. Okay, so this is aggregator, we touched upon this. So GLRM, again, it's a dimensionality reduction uh, algorithm. And it is a parallelized optimization algorithm. So that applies to a variety of loss and regularization functions. So how you can understand like what it does, uh, let's see through this example. This is a very famous, empty cars data set, uh, which is well known in the machine learning community. It's a toy data set, which is used for a lot of problems. So it has few cars and uh, there are about 32 of them. And it has features for those cars. So you have the MPG and HP horsepower and weight and so on. So you have about 11 features. So 32 cars have 11 features, and then you can use it to perform a lot of things, like you can perform regression and analysis. Now, what we are going to do is, we are going to reduce the dimension of this algorithm, of this data set, using GL GLRM. So what it essentially does, if this original data set is denoted by A, which has about 32 rows and 11 columns, GLRM can reduce this to an, two matrices of X and Y. So X is going to have the same number of columns as the original data frame. And Y will have this, uh, X will have the same number of rows and Y will have the same number of columns as was the original data set. But what are the K that we can see here? And this is three in both of them. So K in this call is known as ar archetypes. And what they do is they represent the original features and observations. So we can get the, the number that we want, maybe K is three or four or five. 
and then this algorithm is going to decompose this data frame into two matrices with given rows and columns and archetypes and they represent each observations which is project projected into a smaller dimensional space what, and why do we need to do that why do we need to reduce the dimension because it has a lot of uses uh, a smaller data set requires less of memory less of computational speed feature engineering because this archetypes actually are the important features so it has actually uh, eliminated the features which are not important and data imputation so when you're creating the archetypes here all the missing values are imputed itself so this uh, representation tries to reduce the dimension of your data set but it doesn't so much compromise on the information so a lot of information isn't lost so these were uh, the two algorithms uh, which sort of are used uh, not for like clustering and all, but rather for aggregating your data sets. So I have combined them into one section. For this part of the session, I will touch upon the rest of the three algorithms and see how we use them in industry. So first we come to clustering. Clustering uh, is a form of unsupervised learning that tries to find structures in the data without using any labels or targets. And it is pretty similar to the example that was shown in the beginning of the session for clustering the customers. So for instance, uh, if you see on the graph on your right hand side, we have a lot of data points and assume that all of them were of the same color initially. So after clustering, uh, after using that algorithm, it tries to uh, put these different data sets into different clusters and it partitions them. And uh, ultimately for here, we have three clusters. One is of orange color, yellow and uh, gray. So it has partitioned the entire data set into three distinct groups using some feature. Why K? Because K stands for the number of clusters. So here K is three. And depending upon what you want to give, K could be any number. There's a very interesting uh, visualization which actually cements this whole concept very nicely. And I'd like to show you this. And if you can see here, this is the data set, random. And here we chose K to be four. And now what it does is it starts calculating the distance of all the points from those clusters. And when it, uh, starts calculating the distance, the one which are near to that centroid or that point come into that cluster. So here we can see there are four clusters. So all these data points are near this cluster, uh, near this center point, also known as centroid. All these data points are near this center and this and this. So it goes on until you cannot differentiate between the different clusters. So it starts randomly and it starts building up after that. Let's see now, uh, okay, so this we know it partitions data set, but then how does it actually uh, convey what we're trying to achieve in a data set? And that we can see through a very nice example, an example of customer segmentation, a very valid example used a lot in the industry to understand the patterns of customer or maybe their buying patterns or their interests. So in this notebook, I'll quickly show you how to use H2O3 to find segments in a data set. The data set is very interesting and this comes from UCI machine learning repository, as you can see. So it's a wholesale customer's data set. So it, it, these are uh, clients of a wholesale distributor and it includes the annual spending in monetary units, whatever that may be on diverse product categories. So what are the categories that we have? Uh, we have fresh products, milk, grocery, frozen products, detergent paper, and so on. We also have uh, two other uh, features which are not products, food products. So one is channel. So channel actually means whether uh, uh, it's a retail customer or uh, they're buying for a hotel or a restaurant or, and region stands for the region from where the people are buying it. So we have three regions, uh, Lisbon, Oporto, and other, I'm not sure where these belong to. 
So that's a data set and that's all we know. We have no target, uh, no labels to predict. So as is customary, we're going to start by importing the data set. And by now, I think you're well versed with how that's done and how you initialize the cluster. And then we'll import the data set. So by quickly looking, I think it's the same thing that we saw in the, in the documentation of uh, the data set. So it has a lot of columns, channel, region, fresh, mill, grocery, et cetera. For channel and region, uh, we don't have specific names, uh, but we have encoded uh, with IDs, so the encoded IDs. Let's just replace them with names or values that we can understand. So I'm going to replace channel uh, with one and two, where one stands for hotel or restaurant and two stands for retail. Similarly, for region, I'm going to replace it with one, two, and three, where one, two, and three stands for different regions. And now you can see for channel, I have retail or hotel or restaurant, and for regions, I have other. There might be uh, Lisbon and Oporto too. So now our data set is set. So before uh, sort of clustering, let's quickly see whether any of the features are correlated. And that's going to be a very important thing. And that's a very uh, nice uh, practice to do whenever you're doing any unsupervised learning, because you, it's important to see if like there are other, uh, there are columns which are sort of correlated with each other. So we calculate the correlation and then we sort of create this correlation matrix. And so what you see, we see that if you quickly look at grocery, we see that grocery is highly correlated with milk and with detergents paper. So of course, people who are buying grocery are also buying milk and are also buying detergents paper. We can also see there's a correlation between fresh and frozen, not as high as it was for others, but, but there is sufficient uh, correlation. And again, with the delicacy. Also, there is a correlation between channel and grocery, even though it's negative correlation. So when one increases, the other decreases, but there is correlation. And with detergents paper. So from the correlation matrix, we understand that um, grocery milk and detergents paper are highly correlated columns. And this might affect uh, our model creation later on. So we might have to remove the highly correlated uh, columns. So what we can do is, since we know that uh, channel and grocery uh, are also correlated and this channel and detergent paper also correlated, but negatively correlated, we can also prove this by uh, using a group by statement. So let's just group by grocery and detergents by their mean. So what do you see? What we see is for retail, uh, the amount that is being uh, spent uh, by retail on grocery is way more than hotels or restaurant. So it shows that grocery and detergent paper are primarily being purchased by retail channel and not through the hotel or restaurant channel. Uh, this is a very important revelation because uh, a company might then want to focus its attention only on the more on the retail customers than on the hotel or restaurant customers. So let's start uh, clustering this whole data set to see if we can find some useful information. Again, we'll use the k-means to cluster the data. And like I said, k stands for the optimal number of clusters which the user can provide, but in our case, uh, we'll leave it up to the algorithm to decide. So we're going to import the H2O k-means estimator, and we are going to give in some parameters. So estimate k, we are going to, we are going to let the algorithm decide. So let k-means choose the optimal number of clusters, but we'll make sure that the clusters should not be more than 20. So we have to give the upper bound and just model ID, just for the identification of the model. So that in the future, if we have to retrieve it, we can retrieve the model through its ID. And then we train it on the entire data frame, that's hf.customers. So once the training is over, we can 
Now look at the centroids, the statistics. So we see that there are eight centroids, or you could say eight center points or eight clusters. And this is the size of their clusters. So you can see for the first four, the size is rather big. So this means there are more customers in the first four clusters as compared to the last four. So this also means that probably these four clusters are more important and we should focus on the first four. Now what I'll do is uh, I'm going to add the cluster to the original frame that I had HF underscore customers. And why I want to do that? Because now for uh, every possible uh, input point, I know that it belongs to which cluster. So I'm only looking at the top 10 observations, but for every observation, I have given it a cluster number. So the first observation falls in cluster one, uh, this observation falls in cluster three and so on. So this will help me in identifying uh, which particular, or uh, you could say, channel or which particular data point falls in which cluster. Now let's understand uh, these clusters. We have the cluster number, but what do they actually represent? So we are going to plot them because I think visually a lot of information can be easily consumed than just by looking at the numbers. So I'm going to quickly convert this H2O frame so into a pandas uh, data frame. So the frame, the data frame in H2 is referred to as H2 frame because I want to use matplotlib and I want to plot. So I told you that I'm going to only uh, use the first four clusters because there are more population in that cluster. So I'm going to color them to differentiate between them as blue, orange, green, and red. And I'll uh, populate a cluster, a scatter plot just to uh, plot all the points in the data set. And once I plot all the data set, the, all the points, uh, I'm going to see what is the relationship between the grocery and fresh. And if you remember, both of these were highly correlated uh, features. So here is what we see. We see our four clusters, zero, one, two, three. And there's some interesting points that we can see here. The blue region, if you can see, so the amount of groceries is small here, and so is the amount of fresh products. So both of them are small in this cluster, small as in in terms of monetary, so less amount of money spent on that. For this uh, yellowish orange cluster, uh, this is medium grocery, uh, but medium grocery and again, small amount is spent on fresh products. When it comes to green, Green denotes that cluster where large uh, amount of groceries, the green denotes large amount of groceries, but small amount of fresh products. And red denotes large amount of fresh products, but small amount of groceries. So these were four distinct clusters that we could get. And why is it this happening? Uh, even though we cluster eight columns, why are all these four clusters uh, explaining this sort of everything? That's because grocery is highly correlated with many features, not just uh, one, detergents, milk, channel. So if the amount of groceries someone is buying is directly related to the amount of paper products and milk they purchase and the channel they purchase in, so it's something like, you know, grocery alone has a weight of four in this clustering algorithm. So it's able to explain the properties of the other four features. So this makes grocery as one of the most important feature in our data set. And this can also be proved that if I'm going to plot a box plot of grocery for each of the cluster, I see that gro uh, grocery actually has sufficient weight in all the four clusters. So it's very important. So the way uh, a channel is buying your grocery can tell you a lot about uh, how much they could uh, buy or how much they are uh, sort of investing or uh, putting it into your business. And this is for grocery, this could be for anything else. So if people are buying more grocery, which we saw initially, uh, we saw that uh, the retail are buying more grocery. This means, you know, these are more important channel than the hotel or restaurant. And you might want to focus more on the retail consumers.
what other things that you can do here is you might next want to remove the correlated which i'm not going to touch here but you can uh, remove the correlated uh, features and then you can again run the clustering algorithm to see what are the different changes that you can observe so this is how a typical clustering algorithm works and what are the information that you can extract from a clustering algorithm so let's get back to our slides and let's now quickly jump onto another unsupervised algorithm isolation forest now you know if you could uh, see the name isolation just means to to alienate or isolate and forest is a word that i think uh, it rings familiarity with random forest which is a supervised algorithm that we did and if that is so that's absolutely correct because it is pretty similar in principle to random forest and random forest is a algorithm which is a group of individual decision trees so the property is pretty similar to how a decision tree or a random forest works the only difference is it identifies anomalies or outliers in a data set whereas your random forest Uh, identifies normal points so how it works is it isolates uh, each data point and it splits them whether it's an outlier or it's an inlier now split is a very important factor in case of an isolation forest because the time taken for a split uh, will actually depend upon uh, whether a data set a data point is an outlier or not so let's say how does it how what does it mean now um so if we try to segregate a point which is a non outlier okay so if you see this data set you can say uh, there are two sort of outliers that you can see a fraudster could also be an outlier and a billionaire could also be okay and these are the normal people and let's say it's it's about their uh, income or wealth now if we try to segregate a point which is a non outlier which is normal point uh it'll have many points in its round so it gets really difficult to isolate a normal point and a decision tree has to make a lot of splits to actually reach that normal point but if a point is an outlier it will always be a little away from the normal population and so this makes it very easy to segregate these two points from the normal population so if the number of splits is less uh this indicates that it might be a anomaly or an outlier so let's say uh, this is a very good visualization which actually uh builds upon the same point that i discussed now this green is an outlier and you see quickly in about eight uh, splits it's able to isolate this outlier whereas if you were to isolate this point it would have taken way more than uh it um we more than eight splits to isolate it because you'll have to make a lot of splits to get to this point so this is the whole idea behind uh, an isolation forest let's see then how does isolation forest help in industry and particularly help in isolating anomalies again let's back, go back to our jupiter notebook and see a use case of anomaly detection So the first thing that we do when we have some data is to start exploring the data for which we will have to import the data set this time we are using uh houses in king county so this is a kagal data set which is which consists of the sale prices for a place called king county in seattle and it uh, has the information of homes which were sold between may 2014 to may 2015 now this data set basically has a lot of attributes like date price bedrooms bathrooms a very common data set for performing regression analysis but we're not going to perform regression here and this is also a great example to show how a, a single data set can be used for multiple purpose so we again initialize a cluster import the data set and now let's look at the data set called the house data we have an id a date maybe uh, the day on which uh, it was sold 
price that it is sold, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, square foot of living area, square foot of lot area. So lot area is the, the total area of your house, whereas living area is the area where you're actually uh, living. And uh, a lot of other attributes which you require when you are selling a house. The first thing when you have a data set you, and you sort of have no idea that when that whether you have to predict or whatever you have to do, you could start by visualizing what is in the data set because a lot of times uh, important uh, revelations are made during the EDA process itself. So I will visualize the data set and I'm particularly interested in visualizing square foot living area to see how, what is the pattern of houses in this area? Are they like big, small? So an histogram would be an ideal uh, visualizing tool for looking at the square foot living area. And this shows me that most of the houses have between 2,000 to 6,000 square feet of area. So that's normal tendency. But there are also houses which are above 8,000 and they touch even 10,000. So this is going to be pretty interesting to look at, especially since we want to see outliers. So this is something that we'd want to focus on later. I let me also check another uh, uh, feature which uh, could give me some information. Let's say we could take your build. And when I plot a histogram for this feature, I see that most of the houses are constructed between 2010 and 15. So there's a big jump. And I might want to just go back and look and see why was there a lot of jump between 2010 and 2015. You could also visualize other columns if you have time and if you want to see uh, how they are affecting the price. But for now, I'm just going to look at these two. And but uh, looking at the histogram uh, gives me an aggregated uh, sense of the data set. What if I wanted to look at every individual point in the data set? Now, this could be okay if my data set was small, but this could become a problem if I have a huge data set because then that scatter plot will be too complex and I will not be able to differentiate the various points from each other. So for such a case, we will make use of the aggregator algorithm that we had looked at in the starting of the presentation, which is another unsupervised algorithm in H2. So I'm going to use the aggregator uh, to reduce the size of the data set. And I want to reduce the size of the data set to only 100 records. Now you might wonder, if I only want 100 records, why don't I randomly split my data set? Just take the top 100 observations. It could be okay if I were doing a regression problem, but the problem here is that I want to analyze the anomalies or the outliers in the data set. And if I'm going to randomly sample my data set, those anomalies might get lost. So I would go for aggregator, which will maintain the shape of the data, which is essential in this case. So now I have less points, just 100 of them. And with the help of aggregator, I am just going to give the target number, which is 100, and I'm just going to train it on the entire data frame. And what the resultant data frame is called the aggregated frame now, and I'm going to just plot it. And also normalize the price, I'm just dividing it by 1000. Now I get a scatter plot, and this is pretty easily discernible, and also shows me a very important point that most of the homes, most in the data set, have less than 4,000 square feet of area, and they are also less than $2 million. So this is the general, uh, you could say, uh, essence of the data set, that most of the houses in our current data set are less than uh, 4,000 square feet, and they also cost less than $2 million. Now, this was for square foot level. If we were to create a graph between square foot living and square foot lot, We'll again see this big red bubble here. And this also uh, shows us a similar uh, sort of idea, gives us the same idea. 
most of our houses have less than like 0.25 uh, square feet uh, lot and they also have less of the square foot living area. But there are some outliers you could see here and here and which are very weird. Why? Because if you just look at this outlier, this has less square foot lot area, but it has more living area. Okay. Which is not the general tendency of the data set or uh, and for this area, you could see they, they have a lot of lottage area, but they have very less living area. So I don't know, maybe a lot of houses have been left vacant or whatever it is, but these are uh, definitely some outliers and we would want to look at them. So now after having analyzed the data set nicely, uh, and uh, we have got some sort of idea that what could be the anomalies because anomalies are those data points which are different from the normal pattern and we know what the normal pattern is. Let's start uh, using our isolation forest algorithm. So isolation forest algorithm is the algorithm we'll use for uh, bringing out the anomalies in the data set. So like I told you, the idea behind isolation forest is that anomalies are easier to separate from the rest of the data than other points because it requires less splits in a, in a random forest to isolate them. And so I think since uh, the number of splits is such an important criteria, let us calculate the number of splits or rather average splits uh, that is taken to isolate a particular data point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to import my uh, estimator, isolation forest estimator. I will delete uh, or ignore two columns, ID and date, because um, they don't add much value to our current anomaly detection. And uh, since it's also a random forest, uh, I'm going to set three parameters, seed for reproducibility, uh, maximum depth of 20. It should stop at that point. It could be any that you want. And I'm just giving the model ID again. And we just train our data set on the uh, training frame that we have and the number of columns we want. So the columns are all the columns except the ID and the date. So what you get are predictions and you get a data frame called predictions and it has two columns, predict and mean length. So, uh, the mean length actually is the average number of splits it took to sort of isolate this data point from all the other decision trees. And we can see, so this is for the top 10, we see we have varying mean lengths. Uh, there are like 12.8, there are 6.3, and there are 12.7, and so on. And there's another column called predict. So what is this predict? It's just an anomaly score. Uh, it's a normalized anomaly score that we have. Now, both these, they have inverse properties. So if one is large, the other one is small. So if we just look at the correlation, we could see if, if your prediction is one, the mean length is minus one and so on. Uh, and that's because the less random splits you need to isolate the observation, the more anomalous it is, okay? So, uh, you require less, uh, for instance, yeah, it just requires 6.3 uh, splits to sort of isolate it, hence it's highly anomalous. So this just gives an idea as to which observation is most anomalous than the other. Now, uh, let's quickly plot this mean length to see what is the normal pattern of the mean length in a data set. And what we see is, on an average, it takes between 12 and 15 splits to separate a record in this entire data set. So now we are uh, getting somewhere. It says that for normal data points, it might take uh, 12 to 15 splits. So any splits which is less, probably less than six or five will be an anomaly. So this is how we get to this point of, of understanding how do we isolate the anomalous uh, data points from a data set. And now I'm going to analyze these anomalies. So like I said, uh, an anomaly will be any house whose mean length is less than five. So let's check out how many houses are there whose mean length is less than five. So 
what I'll do is I'll take this mean length column and I'm just going to bind it uh, with the original data frame. And so that I can quickly look here is the mean length. And now I have decided that mean length, uh, any data point having mean length less than five should be an anomaly. And so I get about 44 houses, which appear to be anomalous. How do I interpret them is, uh, I'm just going to replace my mean length uh, with yes or no. So if the mean length is greater than five, I'll say no, it's not an anomaly. And if it's less than five, I say yes. And now if you see, I have converted my unsupervised algorithm into a supervised problem because now I have a target. And to explain this, I could now build a decision tree on this, which now will be called a surrogate decision tree using this column as my target. And once I do that, I can just simply train a random forest here. And this just converts to a, a supervised algorithm. And why do we need it? Uh, our work is closed. Uh, it's just to look, uh, interpret these anomalies so that you can get a graph, something like this. And so it becomes easier for you to uh, explain uh, how our uh, algorithm works and what do you think are the anomalous behavior. So that's how uh, anomaly detection works in real time. You could also leave it here and you could just isolate the yes ones and then you can see why they are, uh, that these were the ones which you think are deviate from the normal uh, general pattern of the data set. So this is how you perform anomaly detection with isolation forest. So we started with a data set. We, we explored the data set and we then finally came to a conclusion that which might be an important factor, uh, which could decide whether it's normal or not. PCA or principal component analysis. Uh, it's a pretty simple uh, sort of uh, an algorithm and it is all also a dimensionality reduction technique. Just like we did GLRN, a generalized low rank model, it uh, also reduces the dimensions of a data set. Uh, so you would ask why would we use PCA? Uh, why don't we use only PCA by another new algorithm? Uh, that's because PCAs are linear in nature and this sometimes causes deficiencies in their performance, uh, much like the deficiency that linear regression has in capturing nonlinear relationships. So it has problems in capturing nonlinear relationships, but otherwise uh, PCA is also used a lot. So if you have a data set with many dimensions, you can just reduce them to sort of two dimensions, which can express most of the, most of the variance in your data set. So I'll quickly show you with a very nice example how it does. This is the great site called Setosa.io. Uh, and this sort of try to visually explain every concept, not every, but most of them. And so if you see here, this is a data set and it's a 3D data set. And it becomes very hard to see all the points because there are a lot of data points plus this cloud. So you don't understand what is happening. We're going to create, uh, we're going to transform them using a PCA. So all these three dimension uh, will be now explained with just two dimensions, which is called principal component one and two. And if you see here, and now this becomes pretty easy to look at. And you don't even have to compromise a lot on information because you'll see if you're coming from a, of a higher dimension to a lower dimension, we would reduce a lot of information. Well, uh, the idea of PCA is to uh, not to lose that information, but uh, be able to capture most of the variance in the data set. So, so we actually got three PCA uh, principal components here, but the first you were able to explain most of the data set. So that's PCA. And even uh, apart from dimensionality reduction, it is also used in domains like facial recognition, computer vision, and even image compression. So, so therefore it finds a lot of use in even bioinformatics and psychology too. So for uh, this demo, this, this is a pretty simple demo. Uh, nothing much to explain here. It's just, I'll just show you how to use the algorithm basically. 
you will just import your estimator. You are going to take a data set. In this case, it's a toy data set, very small one, birth data set. Uh, it has a lot of features with respect to some birds. And uh, you can see there's so many features, you know, it's about more than like five. And if you're going to use PCA and say K here is two, so number of principal components that I want. So after performing the PCA, this whole data set gets reduced to this. And now these two, these two features are able to explain uh, this whole entire data set and you can then continue with this data set instead of big data set. This is a very small example, so might, it might not be of that use, but if you have a huge data set with a lot of dimensions, then PCA becomes, comes in very handy. So you can first reduce the dimension of your algorithm, of your data set, and then you can perform the training part. All right, uh, so that was all. Uh, so uh, a quick recap, because I think we covered a lot of points today. Uh, we quickly looked at what uh, dimensionality reduction, uh, what unsupervised learning. Uh, there are five algorithms in H2O's arsenal. Uh, we touched upon most of them, but in detail, we touched upon anomaly detection and clustering. So with this session, we come to the end of the machine learning module where we went from supervised to unsupervised. The next module will begin uh, next Tuesday and we'll start with the deep learning part on the deep learning capabilities of H2O and driverless AI. And as always, the quizzes and the case studies will be uploaded. Uh, the case study for this session is uh, an, again an anomaly detection uh, problem, but it's pretty different from what we are seeing here but it's a complete end-to-end -end case study. So I'll highly encourage you to at least go through it and see uh, how we are approaching a different problem in this case. For the resources, uh, I've given uh, the link to the, to the documentation, to the glossary, uh, and I might also add the link to my current Jupyter notebooks. And so that's all uh, from my end. Let me know if there are questions. Yeah, Baru. Yes. Uh, so, so we have some questions in the Q and A box. Can you? Uh... Oh, yes, uh, I see now. So the first, so I'll just read out the questions also, so that everybody can listen. So, does DI support unsupervised ML algorithm? If not, is it planned in the next phase? So, as of now, driverless supports uh, supervised learning only. But yes, definitely, unsupervised is also and. Uh, uh, unsupervised can also be done in another way in driverless AI because we have the custom recipes module where you could create your own custom algorithms and then you can import. So through that we can, yes, we can do that. Uh, but as a complete uh, module, we don't have unsupervised learning right now. Are all of the notebooks in the lessons? Uh, well, uh, the link for all of them will be put up in the in the slides and they are on the GitHub repository so you can access them and go through on your own. The case study is a bit different, uh, but uh, again, the link to that is also, but I'll, the, all the links to the current notebooks that I've used will be put on the slides. Uh, is it possible to have a case on preventive, preventive maintenance? So preventive maintenance can be uh, solved using both supervised and unsupervised uh, machine learning. Supervised, uh, if you have historical data of, of the, the defects, which sometimes it's not possible, uh, but then for that case, anomaly detection is a, is a perfect algorithm. And yes, you can use them because one of the use case of an, uh, anomaly detection is an automotive domain uh, for, for finding out defects, you know, so that your whole inventory uh, is, doesn't have to be uh, sort of changed at the last moment. Okay, so uh, okay, so this is done. Uh, is it possible to augment the duration of AWS instances in Aquarium? Uh, it is short for me, but I do what you need to. I think uh, it could be done, of course. Uh, but um, I think Franklin or Rafael will be able to address that. But we'll definitely look at if it's a common problem with everybody. We might look into it if, if the time is short. 
uh, for H2O3, I think it will be a good idea to also probably use it on your local systems also. You will need to download Java for that maybe. <laughs> oh yes, it's easy, definitely. Uh, so we can, we can, we can definitely look into it. Thank you for that feedback. Uh, thanks, we'll, we'll definitely look into it. So I'll just quickly cover the last two questions because does the, uh, does the aggregated algo always preserve the shape of the data? Is this important primarily for identifying outlier data points? No, aggregator algo can be used for other stuff also, especially uh, when you're trying to uh, sort of uh, reduce the dimension of your data set. So it's not necessary, it's just, so aggregation can be used even for supervised algorithms where your data set has a lot of features and you want to reduce them. Uh, you can first reduce your features and then you can apply any other algorithm. So here I wanted to show you as a use case how you can use it in your pipeline. Uh, I'm sorry, AMI, I, what does AMI mean? Okay, so uh, the, okay, so can PCA, PCA be used within a time series analysis? So, so PCA is, is just a, it's just a dimensionality reduction technique. It's, it's used to reduce dimensions like I'm, I've said for, for others also. Uh, and you can use it in any of your, any of your problem. If you have a huge lot of features and becomes, especially uh, one of the use of PCA is uh, sometimes you want to visualize a high dimensional data set and there it becomes a bigger problem to, to visualize because it's not possible to visualize the data set in two dimensions. And at that time, it makes sense to first uh, reduce the dimensions to probably two and then visualize it. Uh, and so a lot of times you could say there are algorithms like PCA or uh, uh, there are, uh, for instance, GLMR. So they are sort of used a lot of times for actually visualizing purpose also. So, but you can uh, definitely use it uh, for any other approach. It's just that you, when it's mostly used when you want to reduce the dimensions. And as far as PCA for time series specifically is concerned, um, it is performed in financial engineering. Uh, that's quantitative finance. Uh, so there it's actually used. I've not used it but uh, it's used in quantitative finance a lot. So uh, I think uh, I'll have to close now. Uh, and if you have any other questions, you can also uh, come for the, the uh, weekend session uh, and you have any questions or any other doubts regarding the material, we would definitely take it up there. Uh, and just in the interest of time, we will uh, sort of have to, have to close the session. But if you have any other problems, any other questions, you can give your feedback. And uh, of course, weekends are always there and we'll get back to you. So we'll see all of you in the next session on deep learning module and hope you complete the quiz and the case study. Thank you.